The Agony in the Garden Gabriel Speaks The first time I was given a message to deliver concerning the plan of the Most High God had to teach humans about divine love was to a high priest about the one who was to come before the God-man. Then, a message to a young woman named Mary. Then, many of us were sent to encourage and confirm him after one of our kind had put him to the test. This time the message was to the God-man himself, and it was very short. Yes, this is the Father's will. I carry a cup to remind him of earlier events, this very evening. Then he offered them his life, blood as a gift of strength. This was such a strong symbol in the Jewish tradition. Life source itself was considered to be held in the blood of the sacrifice. He was in a garden agonizing over his work and mission, that of establishing the kingdom of God among the members of the human race. Had he done enough? Will his friends, the ones he had chosen, be able to carry on where he left off? He had been carrying out the mission and its importance. And they were sleeping. I assured him that this gift of his presence would be the driving force for all of their efforts. The kingdom would grow and God would be glorified. Yes, I said, you have done what was yours to do. You have given them the tools they need to do what is theirs. Be at peace. Arrested, the angel speaks. I hold two sources of light, a torch and a lantern. One light source is free burning and in a sense, uncontrollable, the torch. The other is controlled, encased in glass. Both are used to light a path. Jesus spoke of being a light, not placed under a bushel, but on a lampstand. The people who carried the lights that fateful night did not have the light under a bushel. Jesus' own words were turned against him. Were some of those in the angry procession that night also part of the procession of praise just a few days prior to this one? Then they were praising Jesus for being exactly what he is being arrested for now. How quickly circumstances change, but truth does not change. Many events happened very quickly that eventful evening. Peter tried to intervene. Judas tried to influence. The soldiers tried to bind Jesus, and all three of the disciples fled. As I look on, I try to understand the human condition, how quickly humans are influenced, how easily they think intervening is the answer, and how mistaken are their efforts to control God. Still, Jesus is the person who is completely calm. Jesus rebukes Peter for his impulsive action. Jesus still calls Judas friend. Jesus is candid when asked by the soldiers who he is. The God-man is teaching us his mission. The first station, Jesus is condemned. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I hold a bowl of water just last night. Jesus held the bowl of water as he washed the feet of his disciples. As he did that, was he thinking of his own baptism or of the future baptisms of his followers. Jesus loved water, especially the cleansing power of water. Now, Pilate was trying to cleanse himself of responsibility. I think he was fooling himself. I also hold the sign stating the charges put against Jesus, I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. These charges come from the mouths of both friends and enemies. When asked the question, who 
who do you say that I am? Peter answered with words similar to this title. During the trial, before the Sanhedrin, the chief priest tore his garments at the mere thought of this title being true. In the end, the truth will always win. This title placed on the cross is now a statement of victory, not scorn. Look at Pilate's face. Is there regret in his expression? What is the young boy thinking? Is he thinking of the man who was being condemned? Or is he just doing what was expected of him? Was this the first time Pilate washed his hands during the trial of a condemned person? What was the soldier thinking? He could have been a centurion. How did Jesus interact with centurions? They were the ones responsible for executions. Have I ever been given a title that I felt was untrue? How did that feel? What title would I like to give myself? What title would I like God to give me at the end of my journey? The second station, carrying the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because, because by your holy cross, you, you have redeemed, redeemed the world. The angel speaks. Yes, I am carrying the cross, but I am thinking of something else. Have you any idea of the love God has for the human race? You are the creatures who are the bridge between the material and spiritual worlds. I, as an angel, cannot carry a cross. God did not intervene when some of our species rebelled against him. We understand what a personalized spirit is because that is what we are. We had no excuses. The reason Jesus became human was to show you what it means to relate to God. The cross is a symbol of the power of will, which chooses to praise and glorify God. God delights in you as a member of that race. Your cross may not look like the cross of Jesus, but it has the same power. The shroud that I carry represents the hiddenness of the power and the promise of love and support, which God has assured you. Always remember the power that you have, the power to love God. In the plaque of the second station, Jesus is reaching to embrace the cross. What is he thinking? What is he feeling? Jesus is human, like us in all things. The soldiers seem so indifferent, like they are just doing a job. In what ways do I recognize rejections? disappointments, sufferings as forms of the cross? How do I see challenges as opportunities to propel me toward being a usable instrument in God's hands? What does prayer mean to me? In what ways is God inviting me to prayer? The third station, the first fall. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I am holding the 30 pieces of silver, the price negotiated by Judas for delivering Jesus to the soldiers, and the sword and rooster representing Peter. Both of these disciples were trusted friends of Jesus. Both fell betraying their relationship with the Lord. Only one got back up. 
Jesus loved Judas as a friend, but money, the root of all evil, was selected over loyalty. Peter was supposed to be the rock, the one to whom Jesus entrusted. The destiny and success of the establishment of the kingdom of God and denial was chosen. What a disappointment to the man, Jesus. As an angel, I remember that our species was not given this second chance. You humans are so loved by God that he gave his only son to show how to get up and keep on walking the journey. In this station, we see Jesus falling beneath the weight of the cross. One of the bystanders is gesturing as if to say, you are getting what you deserve. Another is trying to help, and a third is just observing. Jesus himself is in his own world. What is going through his mind as he falls along the way? When I fall along my journey, what does it take for me to get up and continue on? Peter spoke words of loyalty, but actions did not follow. What about me? When did I stand by and watch when someone else was struggling? The fourth station, Jesus and Mary. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because, because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I am the angel holding the symbols of Mary's involvement in the passion of Jesus. Mary knew about angels. We were real to her. The stories you hear about her in the gospel show how real and human Mary's life was. Yes, her heart was pierced as is that of humans. She was offered a cup just as Jesus was. This cup represents not only suffering, but also compassion, mercy, understanding, and both of these things come from God to her and from Mary to all of God's people. One more thought. We angels have no idea what it means to be a mother or a son. This relationship with God, the Father, is something we will never know. In this plaque, Mary is standing erect. She becomes Jesus' strength to go on. Notice that Jesus meets Mary immediately after his first fall. Notice, too, that Mary does not touch Jesus. She does not interfere. She understands that challenges are to be met and surmounted by each individual. Who is the woman standing with Mary? Could she be me? Am I willing to be strength for someone else, even when I am experiencing suffering or rejection? The fifth station, Jesus and Simon. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because, because by your holy cross, you, you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. Simon is one of a very few people who encountered Jesus who was identified by name. Why was he so honored? I carry the reed used to strike Jesus and the crown of thorns. The people who used these two things were not named. Why? Maybe it was because of the attitude all of these people brought to the encounter with Jesus. Simon was reluctant to get close to Jesus but grew close to him in the encounter. So close 
that future believers in Jesus even remembered when he came from and what he did in life. The soldiers were indifferent and shallow when close to Jesus. They were forgotten except for their cruelty. Jesus himself accepted the assistance of Simon. How did Simon feel about being made to help Jesus? Did he question what connection with a criminal would do to his family? What would life be like after this encounter? Are the soldiers moved at all? Or are they cut off from compassion for this condemned man? How are the bystanders responding to what is happening? What would I have done if I had been asked to help. Remember, the cross is not always made of wood. Crosses are all of the challenging events of life. What is the cross that I carry today? The Sixth Station, Jesus and Veronica. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. Veronica was such a little woman. How did she get so close to the opening created by the soldiers around Jesus? All she had in her hands was the veil she was using to shield herself from the sun. Spontaneously, she rushed in and helped Jesus as he wiped his face with her veil. Then she disappeared into the crowd. She didn't notice the imprint of Jesus' face until much later. Now I am holding the veil, making sure that this image of Jesus is seen. You have a body. You have the ability to show the face of Jesus every day of your life. You can show him smiling or consoling, worried or loving. Your face can be the face of Jesus. Jesus depends on your face now to be the grace of God for others. No need to plan it. Showing this comes naturally to those who have the desire to be the instruments of God. The plaque shows Veronica gazing at Jesus's face. He seems to be considering things to come. Neither of the soldiers is paying attention to Veronica. Selfless acts of compassion often go unnoticed. When have I reached out to help another? What were my motives? What good works have I noticed going on around me? In what ways could I acknowledge the good work that I see? The seventh station, Jesus falls again. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because, because by your holy cross, you, you have, have redeemed, redeemed the world. The angel speaks. Yes, this is a mystery to me, the mystery of human suffering. The fact that the God-man endured it as a natural fact of life and the seeming fact that other humans can have such strong emotions towards suffering in the life of others. Either they seem to be compassionate or have an attitude of not caring at all. I hold the pillar of scourging. Jesus had been weakened by this and was physically not able to continue the journey without falling. Human suffering is neither good nor bad. The question is, what do you do with it? What spiritual benefit is there in suffering? Jesus never sought suffering. I don't remember that Jesus performed acts of penance. He experienced suffering in the events of daily living. 
In this station, Simon struggles to help Jesus. The soldier is determined that Jesus reach the top of the hill of Calvary. The onlookers seem satisfied that their goal of defeating Jesus and his message is being met. There are so many emotions going on in this moment. What was Jesus thinking? Could he think at all in the midst of his suffering? Maybe this was another lesson Jesus was teaching among the many others brought to the fore during his passion. When have I experienced suffering? What was my prayer during that time? How do I accept the suffering of daily living as a means of spiritual growth? How am I compassionate toward others who suffer, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually? The Eighth Station, Jesus and the Women. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I carry the symbols of the Roman occupation of Israel. They could represent all people of the non-Jewish world. As I think of the woman of the eighth station, I marvel at the creation in humans, the crown of God's creative work. The kingdom is present in them and they just don't know it. Jesus reminds them when he says, Weep not for me, but for yourselves and your children. They were given the mission to be empathetic toward all. It is through humans that God does the divine work of completing creation. I also marvel at the man, Jesus. His thoughts were and are on the other, not about his own situation, he is teaching even in this extreme event in his life. Jesus raises his hand in a familiar teaching gesture. Only one woman with her two children is pictured. There is no outside force, no soldiers or no one else, just Jesus and the woman. Each person is responsible to spread the kingdom and instill Jesus' passionate love in those whom we encounter. How do I experience the power of the present moment? Where do I see opportunities to spread the kingdom? In what ways is this Jesus inviting me to compassion and love? The ninth station, the third fall. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I hold the ropes and chains used to bind Jesus as he left Gethsemane. He doesn't wear them now. There is no need. He has become one with the suffering. Remembering that Jesus has all of the emotions and pains of the human soul. I understand the depth of pain of isolation, doubt, abandonment, and rejection, which he is combating and which has driven him to the ground this last time. Another thought from the viewpoint of an angel, you as a human being have the capacity to understand the despair of another, to be really compassionate, suffer with, to be truly emotionally involved in the life of another. Thank God for this power given to you and not to us as angels. 
This plaque shows the extreme pain of Jesus. This fall represents spiritual distress, the most painful of human experiences. The continued dedication of Simon and the obvious disinterest of the Pharisees paints a picture of unrelieved pain for Jesus. How do I meet physical and or emotional pain, anxiety, or discouragement? When have I experienced spiritual darkness? What was my response? How do I try to understand this pain in myself and others? The 10th station, Jesus is stripped. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I hold the seamless garment, probably woven by Mary. The soldiers knew its value. They threw dice for it. I wonder what went through Mary's mind. Did she think of the swaddling clothes of long ago? I see Jesus standing shakily, breathing heavily, waiting for what he knows would come next. He had seen crucifixions before. The soldiers came and began to prepare for him for execution. The first thing to do was to humiliate him in the worst way possible. Strip him naked. In the Jewish tradition, clothing was more significant than for most. This is another thing I, as an angel, cannot experience. The respect humans have for the body and its modesty. Jesus knew he had to experience this, like them in all things. Jesus has made it. He arrives at the top of the hill. Simon helps him lay the cross down and supports Jesus for this next excruciating process. Does Simon leave then and disappear into the crowd? Or does he stand next to Mary and John? One of the soldiers seems to have a questioning look on his face. Is he the one who asks, who is this? Are we doing the right thing? The other person seems to just be doing his duty. When have my judgments, shaming, or blaming stripped another of their dignity, their personhood? A certain amount of stripping must happen before the power of the cross can come alive. When have I experienced this stripping? What has come alive for me? The eleventh station, Jesus is executed. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I hold the instruments of torture, the hammer, the nails, and the club. All of them seem so very clean. Time and distance hide the ugliness of it all, the ordinariness of it all. Yet, crucifixion was the usual means of execution among the Romans. It was meant to deter crime. It didn't. Of course, I as an angel do not know what suffering is, but I see the results of cruelty. What a strong lesson Jesus teaches us as he accepts the results of human depravity. One more thought. The hammer and the nails did nothing wrong. They were only acts as was their nature. That doesn't give the soldiers an excuse for what they did. Did any of them realize that they were instrumental in the most revolutionary act ever performed? 
Those who watched as Jesus was crucified were varied. Each had different motives for being at the summit of Calvary that day. Who were these people? The representatives of the Jews seemed content that the right thing was being done. The soldiers are obeying orders. Some of the crowd agree with the Jews. Others are just curious. Are there some present who have benefited from the teaching of Jesus or from the miracles he worked for so many? When have I ever nailed someone to a cross by reliving a perceived injury from that person? When have I ever been the subject of someone doing the same to me? What was my response? What have some of my crucifixions only been my interpretation of another's actions? The Twelfth Station, The Death of Jesus We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The Angel Speaks I hold the articles used while Jesus was suspended on the cross. The spear, the sponge of a vinegar ladder, and a basket and cloth. How little was left that needed a special symbol. The ladder and the basket with cloth will be used after it is all over. Here is another mystery regarding you humans. I don't understand how Humans view time. We angels don't need watches or clocks. We see the whole picture all at once. Why is it that humans can experience the same event as lasting forever and it's been over in an instant? Jesus was suspended for three hours, a very long time to suffer extreme pain. But even as he was experienced this, there were flashes of time when Jesus, the teacher, reappears. Father, forgive them. Behold your son. I thirst. Why have you abandoned me? All of these emotions were experienced by each human in times of great distress. And Jesus shows that these are okay they are human, are part of learning how to relate to God. The plaque of the crucifixion shows Jesus' support system. Mary, John, the other women, and maybe others are there. They will stand by him. We must remember that Mary was older at the time of the Passion, it was difficult, not only emotionally, but also physically, to stand by the cross for three hours. Who supports me when I am suffering? How do I support others when they are in distress? Do I feel free to express negative emotion to myself or to God? The Thirteenth Station, the Pieta. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. It's over. I can't wait to give Jesus his due. I hold the crown of victory and the gloves of respect. Although the signature human condition of the union of material body and spiritual soul is temporarily suspended in the person of Jesus. He is still fully human in all things. Even the awesome mystery of death is a teachable moment for Jesus. The condition of death is necessary in order for resurrection to take place. In this plaque, we see Mary cradling her son one last time. 
Has the sword which pierced her heart been removed? Or must it stay there a little longer? Mary accepts the help of others, some of whom may have been Jesus' executioners, as Jesus' body is hastily prepared for burial. In your mind's eye, imagine, who took off the crown of thorns? Who pulled out the nails? Who washed away the blood and dirt? One of the bystanders is the youthful John. But who is the older man holding Jesus' head? Could he represent Joseph, who was there to support both Jesus and Mary during his lifetime? Who has come to my assistance when I have experienced loss? How do I give myself time and space to grieve? The 14th station, Jesus' burial. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The angel speaks. I stare into space. Although I hold the oil of Jewish anointing and the shroud for the body, I cannot fathom the depth of love God has for the human race. The story is told to the very end. The rituals of closing are played out and all of creation holds its breath. How long before even God cannot wait for the burst of joy which will accompany the resurrection. Here we see Jesus' body being placed lovingly at its place of rest. No one seems to remember that Jesus promised, after three days, I will rise again. No one even dreams of anything beyond the present moment and the fact that it is getting toward evening and the Sabbath will begin. Who are the people who are honoring Jesus at this time? John and Mary are there, but who are the other two? They look like friends. Could they represent any and all Christians? How do I honor the dead? How do I use the fact of my death as an opportunity to advance the kingdom of God? What are the gifts entrusted to me as tools to use for the continuance of Jesus' mission? The 15th station, Resurrection. Gabriel returns. I hold my favorite symbols of the resurrection of Jesus, the Paschal Lamb with its flag of victory and the book of his words. I now have a very important message for all of you who have loved the Lord. This message is a continuation of my message to Mary. Only now I put your name into my greeting. You are full of goodness. You are well known beyond your immediate sphere of activity. You have the fruits of knowledge and wisdom which you are able to share. Do not be frightened. I know you are looking for Jesus the crucified, but he is not here. He has been raised exactly as he promised. Come and see the spot where he was laid, then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead and now goes ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him. This is the message I have for all of you. I want to say it again. You go quickly and tell everyone. This now is your responsibility as a member of the human race. You are to continue what Jesus started, the coming of the kingdom. Thank you.